to say that my sister Angela and I were the closest siblings you'd ever meet would be a gross overstatement. At best, our relationship could be labeled as mutual toleration. We were unabashed, almost aggressively, opposites on everything, and one of us couldn't so much as blow their nose without the other trying to one-up them. Angela was a gregarious extrovert of the two of us, while all my friends and parties and adventures existed solely between the covers of a book. I always felt as if I knew better than she did, at almost everything, but as long as it didn't get abusive or dangerous, our parents didn't mind. We often brought home report cards that were stacked with AIDS as a result of our quest to outdo the other. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that they goaded on us. I know it was a stressful childhood and prepubescence as much for Angela as it was for myself, but on some deeply submerged level, we loved each other. Even after I moved out of my parents' home and she was nearing college graduation on the other side of the state, we made it a point to call each other once a week if for no other reason than to brag about our recent exploits and achievements. Exploits, usually drunken ones on her end, and achievements almost predominantly studious on mine. Six months ago, our parents passed away in a 17-car pileup on I-70 during their return trip home from bailing Angela out of jail. While she would regret the DWI she received that night while driving back to campus from a house party, the guilt of what happened and subsequent blame she laid on herself would stay with her forever. She dropped out of college and moved back home almost immediately and for the first couple of months following the accident, Angela seemed to be handling it all surprisingly well. Our weekly phone calls began to taper off, becoming bi-weekly, then monthly, then non-existent. I tried not to pass judgment, but after not talking to her all summer and watching her social media posts get exceptionally cluttered with obscure, often cryptic messages, worry got the better of me. Taking to the rational ear of my best friend, Ronald, I knew that making the trip to check on her in person was the only way to put my fears to bed. As I was speaking with him late one night when he told me that Angela was in trouble and that I needed to help her before things got out of hand. In detail, he explained that she had been trying to contact our parents. It started as simple prayers, he said. Then she began visiting psychics, holding botched seances, and had recently started experimenting with a Ouija board. I was on the road before the sun came up. When I turned into our neighborhood that morning, I could see my childhood home at the end of the street, and it filled me with a tingle of happiness serenity and sadness, but then a near crippling disquiet struck me as I got closer. Tall, dense weeds filled the yard, choking out every area of landscape my mother had worked so hard on, and the white siding was a splotchy green with mold that had crawled up the exterior walls. I almost cried when a flood of happy memories washed over my mind compared to the neglected, repugnant sight before me. I knew that she was, or had recently been there, as there were fresh tire tracks leading to her car that was parked on the lawn at the rear of the house. I'm not sure how I didn't notice, before anything else, the boards that had been crudely nailed over the first floor windows and front door. Through gaps in the boards, the, the smell of waste and putrid spilled outside and I found it hard to focus on the darkness that lay beyond them. I quietly circled the house, searching for entrance, but before I could call out to her, I heard a wretched sobbing coming from somewhere inside the house. Not wasting a moment, I threw myself at the boards over the front door. The sobbing stopped at the initial hit, but that only escalated my panic. Repeatedly, I smashed against them with full force until they gave in. On the final collision, I felt the searing pain of dislocation wreck my shoulder and I burst through the plywood, tumbling headfirst into the living room. I landed on my back and before I even bothered to pull myself upright, I was screaming her name. Fresh hadn't seen this part of the house in far too long it seemed and sunlight poured into the room. The commotion had caused stagnant dust to swim in its rays. It fluttered overhead until finally settling on and inside me with every breath as I worked to compose myself. I yelled for my sister again, choking on the loosened filth and static fetter, craning my neck which gave me an upside down view of the space behind me. I saw a half-burned Ouija board driven deep into the wall. 
the nearest object to me was a sharp, broken piece of plywood. I grabbed it with my good arm and used it as a crush to raise myself from the grimy carpet. At the sudden appearance of Angela, standing only a few feet from me, I nearly toppled over. Angela! I yelled out of concern and surprised fear. The effulgent, pouring streams bathed her naked, emaciated body off which her dying, gray skin sagged. The gorgeous curls that once framed her face had been clawed out, leaving angry patches of pink skin on her scalp and her eyes were no longer emerald but were filled with milky cataracts. I wanted to puke or die or both. I opened my mouth, but she spoke first. You don't belong here. She growled through dry, ragged lips that barely moved. It was a voice I had never heard before and one I assumed only existed in nightmares. I didn't find Mom and Dad, but something else. Sobbing and scared, I begged her to come with me. An Angela, please. Not so much as a singular muscle twitched hinting at her next move before she charged me. Her sharpened fingernails targeted my throat and her voice rang like a chorus of hell. Quick movement was impossible for me and out of primal terrified instinct, I brought my right arm up in defense, clutching the splintered wood. The impact was soft and smooth, like she was formed of melting wax when the briary lance pierced her flesh. A mere breath from my own face, Angela writhed for a moment, having pushed her way nearly up to my whitened grip on the wood that had pierced her heart and sliced through the flesh of her back. No recognizing stare or smiling release crossed her face. No last words. Just death. I laid her body on the floor as gently as I could manage, backpedaling until the wall stopped me. Something familiar caught my eye. After prying the Ouija board from the wall, I laid it on the floor next to her. I snapped off the pointed end of the bloody protruding weapon and set it on the board. I placed my good hand on it, stifling my tears and my guilt and the billowing sadness inside me. Angela was dead, but I knew she couldn't be far. I needed to know what happened to her. I needed to understand what demonic aggressions turned her into such an inhumanly beast. Ronald, I began. Ronald, are you there? I need to talk to my sister.